Welcome to our podcast. Whether you are a returning viewer or this is your first time joining us, I want to welcome you and we are so glad you are here today with us. I am Emily Stevens, the Senior Marketing Professional for our consumer team at HTLF, and I'll be your host for this week's episode. As HTLF, we are a diverse $20 billion financial services organization. We're headquartered in Denver, Colorado. We serve customers across the West, Southwest, and Midwest. Our unique model powers our geographically diverse group of affiliates with strength through scale, technology, and efficiency across our footprint. Our local bank brands serve our communities and customers through commercial, small business, and consumer banking. We leverage our deep roots and community commitment to deepen relationships and create new ones. We believe through our local brands, local leadership, with local decision-making, we are better able to partner with the communities where we serve. We differentiate ourselves by offering a diverse breadth of products and services with the scale of a $20 billion bank to each of our local markets. This really is local banking with the scale to compete. Today, we are digging further into an important topic that has been in recent news headlines, fraud, and the new scams that have arose. More specifically, we will discuss with our experts here what today's bank fraud looks like, common scams, and most importantly, what to do when it comes to protecting your finances. I'm joined here today by two of my colleagues at HTLF, Tracy, our fraud risk manager, and John, our fraud director. Hello, team. Please introduce yourselves and give us a little bit more detail about you. Great. Thank you, Emily. So my name is Tracy. I'm the fraud risk manager for HTLF, which means uh, I work very closely with our team and with our other departments to shore up any procedural gaps, look for trends that are occurring out in the U.S. and what we can do to protect our bank and our customers when that same scam comes knocking on our door. Uh, we work very closely with our marketing, marketing team on getting customer communications out, articles, cool podcasts like this, and webinars, uh, which, uh, you know, anytime we have an opportunity to get in front of our customers to talk about consumer scams, business frauds, et cetera, we uh, definitely want to be able to do that to help out as much as we can. Great. Thanks, Tracy. John, what about you? Tell us a little bit more about you and your role. Sure. Thank you for having us again, Emily. Look, uh, look forward to have a great conversation today. Uh, I am the fraud director for HTLF. Um, so I manage all bank fraud as it relates to HTLF from an investigative standpoint, from an, a detection standpoint, kind of card fraud, uh, basically the whole gamut of, of financial crimes here at HTLF and trying to help our customers, help our organization kind of move forward and do what we can to help our customers. And, you know, the one good thing here too is, you know, even with Tracy and myself, we have over like 15 years, 20 years experience in this financial crimes network. So we can, we have the, the, the subject matter knowledge to be able to really hone in and make HTLF a great organization for our customers. Yeah, for absolutely, which is so important. Thank you both for joining us today and in, in discussing this important and relevant topic. Um, let's, let's talk about bank fraud. And in this age where technology and digital conveniences have come so far, so have scammers, unfortunately. So they're more elusive than ever. Um, it's important we recognize the red flags associated with that. So. John, let's start with you. What's what's bank fraud? And Tracy, you can tap in here too. And, and what are those red flags we should be looking out for? Sure. You know, bank fraud is, is kind of identified in two ways. You have the really tough definition. I want to break it down a little bit. Um, Tracy, do you want to kind of go over sure. that tough um, definition? So the FBI defines bank fraud or financial institution fraud as a bad actor using the financial institution and committing fraud against the financial institution. Now that has evolved significantly. Now we have uh, many more kinds of schemes running the gamut of consumer fraud, business fraud. We also do still have those instances where somebody is committing first party fraud against the bank. So those, you know, we as an institution need to be mindful of. But what we see a lot more frequently is uh, the bank fraud that involves transactional or transactions. So I think that uh, John can speak to the evolution of that, uh, that you know falls a little bit more narrow under the broad umbrella of bank fraud 
by the federal government's definition of it. Yeah, and that's, I mean, spot on. So, you know, breaking it down a little bit, bank fraud, as Tracy alluded to, is transactional. That's how the banks are, you know, banks and customers. That's how does money walk out the door? So we always like to look at those channels. What is bank fraud? So we consider bank fraud like check fraud, wire fraud, ACH, account takeover. And what I mean by account takeover is somebody, uh, some fraudster compromising credentials to log into their online banking to basically send transactions wherever they, they deem without the customer's knowledge or with the customer thinking that they're actually, you know, working with the organization. A lot of people don't know, you know, they provide their credentials to some some unknown person and then fraud happens, knowing that, you know, one of the things that we try to push out is the banks will never ask for specific information to try to protect from that standpoint. So from transactional matter, we look at the actual channel. How did the money leave? Whether it's, like I said, credit card, check fraud, all the above. That's the biggest, biggest viewpoint in my eyes of how actually fraud occurs including elder exploitation. That's, that's a huge, huge, you know, concept with, with bank fraud as well. Just it's, you know, fraud is fraud and it's just a matter of what channel that the money wants to leave. So the fraudsters can pick one channel, whether it's check fraud, whether it's wire fraud, and then the money can leave. A lot of the schemes are the same. It's just a matter of how can we trick the bank and the customer to get this money walk out the door. Do you mind just tapping a little bit more into elder fraud? Um, I know that that's been a hot topic lately. Um, just diving a little bit more in, into that um, specifically and what folks can be on the lookout for when it comes to that. Sure. Um, you know, one of the biggest things today that's a hot topic is fishing. You know, fishing is something that's picking up steam with the cyber, cyber component of it. There's a lot of breaches with, you know, whether it's, you know, a department store, whether it's a restaurant, data breaches occur, unfortunately. You know, we have private information, PII data that's stored all over, whether it's a credit card that, you know, the companies keep certain activity or there's readers out there that a fraudster can, you know, come across a card reader and be able to get specific information to, you know, create a counterfeit card or have information to create counterfeit checks that it, that's really huge today. So one of the biggest thing, you know, from a consumer actually and a business standpoint is just to understand if somebody's reaching out to you, who are they? Is it truly your bank? Is it truly, um, you know, the person who they say they are? Um, that's, that's where we start to notice a lot where fraud does occur and people unfortunately fall into these types of schemes that at the end of the day, they could lose millions thousands, their life savings, et cetera. So when you're looking at emails, look at who it's coming from. A lot of time they'll use an email address and that, that mimics the one, like a legitimate one, but maybe add additional number or an additional uh, letter that makes that person think, hey, this is legitimate. Identify those grammar, yep. or frequency and urgency. Um, I mean, there's just, yeah, there, there's a lot of little things that people take for granted because when we read something as a human being, when you read it, you're, you're like, you're reading it as you want you're to filling think in what, the blanks what it's actually too. saying. Yep. Sometimes you skip. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's the hard part that happens. I mean, I'm guilty of it myself. That's a, that's a focus that I know that you have to pay attention to uh, because we're all human. We're all creatures of habit. We all want to believe that all humans are great. Um, and for the most part that they are, but there is that subsect that will try to get you. And I think it's yeah. generational. One of the things when we train on spotting elder financial exploitation or elder financial abuse, when we're talking to our frontline staff, we look, we tell them to look at activity outside of the normal pattern. As John alluded to, we are creatures of habit. We make the same dozen or so transactions per month. And when somebody comes in and wants to withdraw $20,000 cash and they never have withdrawn that much money before, that's when you ask questions. You find out more about this. Are they being coached? Are they being told what to respond? Who is asking them for the money and why? Maybe mm -hmm. that conversation will lead that teller or that frontline staff member to find out 
Amazon called them, quote, Amazon, or their grandchild says they're in, in jail and need help. Any wire activity that's out of the normal pattern, any cash activity that's out of the normal pattern can be a clue for these schemes that target our elder customers. And that mm -hmm. I think is one of the keys is who is being targeted and why. And we see our elder customers targeted for these social engineering schemes, particularly online, particularly with that sense of urgency coming along with them. They're hoping that their targeted victim won't think it through before coming into the bank and, and conducting that transaction or allowing that access to conduct mm -hmm. that transaction. And it's particularly important with our elder customers because of that extra level of vulnerability. Yeah. And just to add to that too, you know, as we're having those discussions, you know, people do get upset that the bank probes into these types of um, nuances of whatever the customer is trying to do. And one of the things that I'd want to point out there is we're not doing it because we're being nosy. We're doing it for a multitude of reasons. One of the biggest one is to try to help the customer and identify what actually would happen. So it could be legit, you know, but we're asking questions to try to prevent the customer mm -hmm. from having any losses or having, you know, fraud on their account, et cetera, which, you know, we have to know those things, you know, because a lot of our customers are used to funnel money to another fraudster without realizing it. Right. Um, so, you know, banks are, and not just even H here at HTLF, overall, that's a, re that's a requirement mm -hmm. that we're, that we have to do. And it's something that we take serious because we want to help the customer. We do not want to have to go back and try to chase this money down for the customer because in reality, a lot of times when right. that money leaves, it's gone. So it's really, it's really important to have those discussions to understand and just to have that mentality from a customer perspective that we're not doing this out of, out of spite or out of being nosiness or want to know what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. That's number one priority is protecting our customers and doing what we can for them. So on, along the same lines, you know, how can our customers or, you know, those out in the world, how can they protect themselves? Stay one step ahead. Um, how can they, how can they be doing that? Um, this could be for, you know, customers or everyday consumer, or let's say someone has a small business. What can they be doing to stay one step ahead of these of this fraud, of these scams, because it seems like every day, you know, something comes up that's new or different. So how can they stay one step ahead to protect themselves? Pay attention and slow down is my number one rule. Uh, removing that sense of urgency goes a long way in preventing these scams from happening, preventing somebody from falling victim to them. You know, it's estimated, I saw a figure in the UK, 80% of consumer scams start on a social media platform. If you remove yourself from that sense of urgency, from that just accepting what you see in front of you, I think that would go a long way to reduce that number. So paying attention, if you're in a business, uh, whatever size, small business, medium, large, look for what your bank offers you in terms of financial protections positive pay for check and ACH. What that does is that adds an extra layer of basically the system pausing for you to make sure this is legitimate. Adding that extra layer of protection. When you, for personal accounts, for example, when you can't have a positive pay type thing on there, regular reconciling of your accounts, make sure you recognize everything. But I think the, the key is going to be that pausing, that thinking it through, does this make sense? Why is my grandchild calling me from Mexico when I just saw them yesterday and everything was fine, for example? Um, why do I need to wire $40,000 to release this shipping container full of gold? That doesn't actually make sense. Uh, all of these things, if you just pause and think about it, that removes the sense of urgency. That will save a lot of time, a lot of headache, a lot of losses. Yeah. And, you know, to add on that, you know, from a business perspective, the, one of the things that, that I see not happening the, mo the most is no checks and balances. You know, if, 
you want to make sure you kind of split up duties and roles. That way you can, you know, companies can identify maybe there's embezzlement going on, you know, not have the same person writing checks and reconciling the checks. Um, that's a big deal. Have policies and procedures in place. You know, one of the biggest scams right now for businesses is uh, business email compromise. So, you know, have those processes and, and procedures in place where if you're paying something, make sure you speak to the person who actually sent you the invoice or speaking to, you know, your cohorts that you receive an email to send, you know, requesting you to send money, you know, to a vendor or, or another person. Make sure you speak to that person and not just take the email as gold in, in, in the gospel, because a lot of the times that's how fraudsters are getting around this is taking advantage of people that do not pay attention um, from the consumer. And well, actually, before I even get to the consumer, this goes in for consumer too. you know, FTC, Federal Trade Commission has a lot of free resources on their website, uh, whether it's like little mini books on how to protect yourself, you know, making sure that you're for businesses that you have your your devices protected from malware identifiers that can be able to detect if somebody you know compromised your email or even the computer in general they have lists of a variety of scams i could talk for hours about all the different scams that are out there and what components are similar different etc there's so much information out there on the federal trade commission the fbi uh sites um, and a lot more sites that I can't even think of right now that actually provide you really good information on really how to protect yourself from a business standpoint and a consumer standpoint. And that's the biggest, I know, thing that we see is the lack of education. And that's why we take it important to add, if we go to an HTLF website, we have a fraud button where this product that we have on our website will actually go through anything you can imagine fraud related. It's a great service that I'm excited to have on our website because it's just, it's all informational base instead of us, you know, having to write something up or speaking to it. It's something that is updated regularly and it has great up to date knowledge on all fraud. So our customers definitely should take the time to take a look at it because education is, is number one. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We'll be sure to, to link that here in the comments, in the description of this podcast. I know sometimes those questions are hard to ask or, you know, it's, it's difficult to bring up, you know, if you feel like you've been a victim of fraud or maybe, you know, a little bit weary um, to have those conversations with the bank, but yeah, just encouragement of, of having those open conversations and communication and given whether it be HLF a call or your local bank partner a call, I think that's so important just because this world is ever changing. Um, what other resources do you all recommend that customers, you know, everyday consumers, small businesses can do um, to take action to protect themselves, whether that be on websites or Johnny mentioned some other of the, um, some government websites too, what other resources um, do they have available to them to help stay protected? I, I want to mention one specific one, then, then I know Tracy has some as well, but um, like elder exploitation, for example, a lot of caretakers may not even know what's going on or have the ability to understand what to do. Um, you know, if you're a caretaker, you have specific things that you can do on a, like if you're a power of attorney or something along those lines, but the AARP f for fraud, they have a lot of webinars. They have a lot of, you know, written documentation out there that really helps that they can make a phone call in and ask those specific questions on how to protect an elder from financial crime. Uh, they've been growing in that space a lot that I think it's, it's wonderful what they're doing, you know, because when we deal with what we call victims, that's kind of a negative kind of tone. So what we'd like to do is really, you know, help these individuals really just grow and understand what is happening and then take their story and teach people about it. That's the mindset with AARP in their, in their fraud kind of space. So I wanted to throw that out there as well. Yeah, actually, if I can build on that for a moment, I'm so glad the language is changing. Uh, from a victim blaming and victim shaming mentality to a more helpful mentality, 
because uh, when somebody is impacted by one of these financial crimes, uh, it is often through no true fault of their own. They are manipulated. They are socially engineered. They have uh, maybe limited understanding of the financial world and they're vulnerable because of that. Many, many things, myriad things go into why somebody would be impacted by a financial crime. AARP is a fantastic resource and the things they're researching, what they're putting out there on who is targeted, who, uh, who gets what kind of phone calls, repeat victimization is a key as well, because once somebody uh, falls for a scam, they're often put on a marks list to be continually targeted. So these are things that you need to be aware of that's going on. The additional resource I would like to provide is uh, particularly in terms of identity theft or synthetic identities or new accounts being opened using your stolen data. And that is to go to each of the three credit bureaus. You can do this online and freeze your credit. It is free to do. You set up a pin online. If you decide one day, oh, I need to go get a new car or I want a new credit card or it's time to apply for a mortgage, you go on and you can temporarily thaw your credit for that exact period of time and then boom, you're protected again. That is the best mitigation, not, pre not entire prevention because these are, these are bad actors. They're going to, to, to try to open up new accounts using stolen information, of course. But if you can do that one thing to protect yourself, that will go a long way in mitigating new accounts being opened using your stolen information. Yeah. And to kind of put it in that perspective too, just kind of everything across the board. Um, when you open an account at, at, at your financial institution, there's a lot of things that the customer is liable for. So, as in any account, which I'm sure, you know, all of us here have opened bank accounts before and you receive like a disclosure, these are the rules for the account, you know, small writing. So not everybody always reads that document in detail, <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of information regarding liability because uh, every action has a reaction. And if, if you're operating an account in a, in a certain way, whether you're using like stamp signatures versus wet signatures, you know, liability shift changes there for businesses utilizing a security uh, product that we offer. If you don't utilize that, you could be held liable and vice versa. Uh, always read those disclosures and use what the bank has because it's truly will protect you. Because if you have fraud on your account, unfortunately, it is a painstaking process to go to for the bank to ensure that your account is no longer compromised. So that could involve an account being restricted for a period of time. It could be uh, items that are attempting to post to your account that are being returned, um, even though they're legitimate. And it's just going to take time for you to set everything back up again. And that kind of back, you know, if it's a business, then your day to day is going to stop and struggle because of that, accepting payments, et cetera. So, I always yeah. look at that as my Bible uh, and, and I would push, you know, to have that understanding of what all those disclosures are and don't just assume or take a word of, of another individual because they saw something on TV mm -hmm. or they talked to somebody else. Understand for me, if you're going to enter in a contract, make sure you at least understand the liability shifts that you could take if mm -hmm. you do something a certain way. The fraud Bible. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everyone should have that um, in their bookshelf. <laughs> I like that. Well, I really appreciate you guys jumping on and having this conversation with us. It's such an important topic. And, you know, we're going to be doing a series of this, which is I'm, I'm really excited about. So this is the one, the first one of um, our series. So we will be having more of these conversations diving more specifically into topics such as the social engineering, more on elder um, abuse, um, and then also in regards to business lines too, and more specifically about businesses, what they can do to protect themselves, what we're seeing for common scams out there. So I'm excited to continue the conversation um, here in the next coming episodes, but thank you for joining us. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining in um, be sure to tune into the next 
couple episodes to complete our series here. Um, we will, like I said, we'll be joining you in a couple weeks here. Um, so until then, um, you can find us on htlf.com. Uh, we're always looking for your feedback, um, ideas on other topics um, that you would like to hear about um, and hear more from our sub subject matter experts here. So um, be sure to let us know what you think of this episode or if you have other ideas in the comments. Uh, we do review those and we thank you for those in advance. Thanks again for joining us and until next time, be well.